preferred status and disease mineral in Esmeralda counties? I apologize uh, very much to. I apologize very much to the board and the public uh, to not delay their Saturday any longer uh, for me being late. Uh, Mike Cox, big game staff biologist, Nevada Department of Wildlife. All right, so uh, had came to you in June to uh, request an amendment to our big game release plan to accommodate the Garfield Hills and the Gillis Range augmentations. Uh, we had. Uh, information that had recently come across our desk about some dis potential disease issues and at that time uh, you tabled uh, that uh, that decision to amend the, the, the release plan so we've uh, pulled some information together um, on the general area uh, around the the Garfield Hills and I want to present that to you this afternoon. The, uh, the big blue polygon line is uh, what I consider a uh, meta population within that. You've got on the south end uh, in Esmeralda County, Lone Mountain, Silver Peak, Monte Cristos, Volcanic Hills, and then uh, into Mineral County, you got Miller Mountain, Candelaria Hills, uh, Excelsiors, Pilot Mountain, the south end of the uh, Gabs Valley, the Garfield Hills, and the Gillis. And, and I've been really thinking that uh, it's li likely that these meta populations need to be uh, focused on when we look at things anymore, although we haven't necessarily in the past, but it, because of all the connectivity that we'll show you, and you can just see that. Uh, they're, they're, they're fairly close to one another, and there's lots of them. I mean, within this meta population, uh, most of the herds have been doing really well, including um, an adjacent state, the White Mountains. And we're going to talk about the White Mountains a little bit later. But that is only 15 to 18 miles away. Um, once you jump into the volcanic hills, uh, Commissioner Robb and Wallace, know, they know that country, and that's nothing. It's absolutely nothing for them to to go from the, that black line. So um, they're really probably part of that meta population. In the release, In the release uh, we did last fall, we augmented the Excelsiors, uh, Marietta area, uh, uh, kind of on the north, that north area to the left of where the Excelsior Mountains is. And then we also augmented the uh, Candelaria Hills for the first time. At a couple different, uh, the town site and and uh, the mine site. Different each different color is uh, a different bighorn uh, that was released on those two complements. And just want to um, point out the the connectivity that we have uh, based on the, the movement of these animals. Now we know that. Initial release, you're going to have some um, wandering, some sheep going on walkabouts. Uh, so I'm just going to go quickly through these animals. Um, this uh, lavender, uh, light purple, pink, this is a ram. He, in, he initially went down to the volcanic hills, checked it out, checked out Miller Mountain, came back um, to the main core of the Candelaria Hills around the town site, Guzzler. Um, and then just recently, he decided he, he wants to live in the Excelsior Mountains. So now this is uh, that animal right there. So he's, he's now in the Excelsior Mountains. Uh, this ram here, the other ram is, is this purple. Uh, he was, was released in the Excelsior Mountains here uh, in the Moho Mountain area. Uh, he spent uh, a few months in the Garfield Hills uh, the proposed release site, he's back living uh, where, where we'd like him to, um, here in the Excelsior Mountains. Uh, we had a ewe that was released uh, on the town site. Um, she went down the Volcanic Hills, and then she says, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go live my life out in the Monte Cristos. wasn't quite what the script was for her, but that's where she's at, and that's where she's, uh, looks like she's going to stay. 
She went. She went from Volcanic Hills across Columbia, salt marsh there. You got it. That's a. <laughs> there, the, That's you, a you picked up the point. Very good. Okay, so um, we had a couple others that aren't too far off where where we like them to be. One animal is right on the mine site. Uh, this this light green. Um, it's moving from the uh, that guzzler site down into the Miller Mountain. Really great stuff. And uh, the blue, uh, she was up here, and now she's living down in the Miller Mountain area um, on some sort of a water source that we're unaware of. But just to kind of give you um, an appreciation for uh, the connectivity amongst all these different herds, uh, the highway not being a barrier, some of these big salt, salt flats not being a barrier, um, there is a lot of land bridges in this meta population. All right, I'm going to um, start this, but I'll transition and, and let Dr. Wolf um, continue with some of the diagnostics that we uh, have for this meta population. Um, and then we're going to transition once we're done with some of the disease diagnostics of some of the animals that were collected, sampled, um, and tested. Uh, I'm going to have uh, Jason Salisbury provide a, a quick update with some of his field observations, both uh, being in the field with optics and then using trail cameras for trying to identify different subherds, uh, lamb numbers, and uh, and then we'll we'll get to kind of where I think we should go or my recommendation. So I'll let Dr. Wolf continue. Dr. Perry Wolf, uh, Nevada Department of Wildlife Veterinarian. So. Um, We've uh, instituted, the reason it says 2013 hunt season is we've instituted some passive disease sampling where we're asking hunters to turn in lungs and also um, asking um, taxidermists to save the leftover portion of the head after they've removed the horns. And then we're going back and sampling those, um, looking for mycoplasma ova pneumoniae as a way of being able to do this without actually having to capture the animals. So in um, 2013, we got some heads in and one of them was um, uh, from Lone Mountain, which we had a little bit of a suspicion that there might have been something gone be going on because a uh, hunter who happened to be a veterinarian, so we knew he was credible, um, had heard a U coughing during scouting in July, so there was some concern over that. So during that uh, season, we got a harvested ram in, and it was nice because not only did we get the um, lung tissue in that we were able to test, but we also got his head back from the taxidermist. And both the lung tissue and the head had presence of mycoplasma, which to me means that there was pneumonia at some point, because that's the only way you're going to get that bacteria down um, into the lung tissue. This kind of triggered... Uh, a little bit of concern on our part, especially with the history of uh, in July having um, someone here, uh, some, a coughing you, and we made the decision in April to put um, helicopter in the air and go ahead and do some lethal sampling and try to figure out what was going on. Um, we ended up uh, aerial shooting, lethally sampling three animals that basically were taken at random um, because that was what we could find and that in that particular, we were looking for younger class animals, but what they found um, was uh, two ewes and a um, young ram. Um, all of them had fairly severe pneumonia um, consistent with lungworm infection, um, and the only difficulty with that is that many of the cells that are present in the lung with lungworm infection are the same cell types that you can see with mycoplasma, so you can't differentiate that particular cell type from mycoplasma, but we also saw the presence of the larva of the lungworm. So what we, all we could do is really call it lungworm pneumonia in those animals. Um, two of the three animals had blood antibodies to mycoplasma of pneumonia, so we know that they'd been exposed. And one of them had mycoplasma um, recovered from her upper respiratory tract, her sinus cavity, and uh, none of them had uh, any pneumonia or had any mycoplasma actually in the lung. So probably the majority of the damage in the lung was caused by the lungworms, but show that they're, they're at least carrying uh, mycoplasma. 
Um, also, at that time, we got a hunter harvested head in from the Silver Peaks, which from Mike's map is quite close by. Um, that head was also sent in, and that animal, uh, we were also recovered mycoplasma ovin ammoniae from that sinus swab. There was no lung tissue which accompanied that, so all we had was the sinus swab. The biologist in that unit went out and did a fair amount of surveillance, and in July of uh, this year found, uh, identified a lamb that was coughing and acting clinically sick and went ahead and harvested that animal. Um, that animal had fairly severe pneumonia um, consistent with mycoplasma of pneumonia and we also cultured pastorella species out of the lungs and also isolated um, mycoplasma from the upper respiratory tract. That just gives you, uh, that's just a little picture of that lamb's lungs with the dark on the purple on the right-hand side uh, indicating pneumonia and the light pink on the left-hand side uh, is fairly normal lung tissue, but this lamb had uh, fairly extensive lesions. Then in May, in the Excelsior range, uh, in May of 2014, uh, there was a very sick uh, ram observed by drill workers um, and the next day it was very thin, the next day it was found dead, uh, brought up to the lab and um, necropsy performed. Uh, it had moderately severe pneumonia and a very, very severe chronic sinusitis with a large amount of, uh, of the uh, tissue of the skull was um, involved with that. Uh, there was mycoplasma of pneumonia and pastorella species recovered from uh, the lung tissue and also from the sinus tissue, which is not uncommon. They also get these mixed infections um, in the sinus tissue with this chronic sinusitis in, in these animals. Then in um, a couple of weeks later, there was a report of a dead uh, ram lamb um, that some of the uh, drill workers found. That animal was recovered. Unfortunately, due to temperatures, um, it had probably been dead for 24 hours, and we were not able to look at the tissues microscopically um, to see, you know, the distribution of cells, but we were able to um, recover mycoplasma of pneumonia from the sinus and the lung tissue of that animal, and it definitely appeared to have pneumonia on the gross exam. So we were concerned about where this might have come from because this is not an area that's known to have, especially Lone Mountain, not to have domestic sheep, certainly trailing route, and no known operators that might have um, pet goats or sheep nearby. So when we were talking about, um, with our California colleagues, about possible um, collaboration efforts, and we know that in the Spring Mountains, we share a strain of mycoplasma of pneumonia in our Spring Mountain um, desert bighorns that is consistent. One of those strains is one that appears to be based in Nevada. The other strain is one that's been found down in the Mojave Desert and caused a recent outbreak there. So our suspicion was that the sheep, sheep are moving up and down this corridor um, and, and uh, moving the mycoplasma around. So with the proximity of the White Mountains, we requested that they um, go back and look at some of their archive tissue and see if we could determine whether this strain of mycoplasma of pneumonia, where it came from, and there were samples that their original die-off there occurred in 2005, and they're still, um, those couple of archive tissues have been sent up to Waddle for, to recover the MOV and try to do some further strain typing, but they also had already um, had sent samples in in 2009, and those had been strain typed, and the two uh, Lone Mountain samples um, both matched uh, the White Mountain ones uh, identically on gene sequencing. So we at least know that in those, in that instance, the White Mountain strain, probably there were sheep moving back and forth and uh, brought that over to Lone Mountain. Um, we're still pending some strain typing on the Silver Peak animal and on the Excelsior animal to see if the sheep are moving this within the metapopulation or if we have another point source that may have brought um, a new strain of mycoplasma in either a domestic sheep or goat. It's a suspicion. Okay. All right, so then next I'd like to have uh, Jason Salisbury, who 
jumped out of moving him his wife into a new home today, and uh, I asked him to come down here and and uh, give us an overview of some of the information he's collected over the last couple months. So I've got a map, um, and I'm going to let Jason just kind of point out where some of the uh, information that he collected. <clears throat> okay, so starting. Starting in here, we got a guzzler called Townsite here, and then a guzzler over here called Mine Pad. There's a guzzler that we just built that was called Marietta. And um, of course, the volcanic hills are right in here and what have you. Um, before there was water on the volcanic hills, it was kind of like a, it was a winter range and what have you for sheep from the Silver Peaks. Could have been sheep from the White Mountains and stuff. And then we developed water on there, so now there's year-round sheep. Um, historically, in Miller Mountain in that, there was sheep seen in the 80s there um, on winter range, which could have been from White Mountains or who knows what. There were just some historical reports. Um, we developed water in um, 2013 in these three spots here. And then we did this guzzler here. And then we finished off this year um, three, three large projects in the Garfield Hills. Um, I released because there was 30 sheep here in this release in November of 2013. Um, to try to imprint sheep on a particular guzzler, I felt more comfortable uh, putting a complement of 15 at town site and a, and a, a complement of 15 at mine pad. Um, just so that at least one group would imprint and take. Um, the group at town site, um, initially, it seemed like um, we had eight individuals out of the 15 that stayed in there. The, the remaining individuals, which I'd never, I'd never seen, but I just assumed with the U, um, the one U that went to the Volcanic Hills and then went to the Monte Cristos, I haven't verified it yet with the ear tags or anything, but I assume that the other seven are probably associated with the Monte Cristos now. Um, so um, in, in June, I set out uh, trail cameras with the video setting and the audio setting on 14, wa 14 known water source sources that the sheep, some of them use a little bit, some of them use a lot, which would be there's a Defender Guzzler here, the Marietta Guzzler, um, you got Storm Canyon. Uh, White Rock, and then you had the Garfield Hills stuff. And then I had Townsite, Defender, and Miller um, set up with cameras too. Nothing on the Volcanic Hills. Um, the, the first initial deal on Townsite, um, I picked up the cameras about a week and a half ago and then put new cards in them. Um, I identified on the cameras <clears throat> one year, one year with no ear tag with one lamb, and two of the original uh, orange ear tagged sheep that were released out of the 15. Um, and so there was only three known sheep that I seen on the guzzler on town site. Um, mine pad, out of, with using the, the cameras and stuff, um, we identified three of the orange ta ear tags that came from town site over on mine pad. Um, both collared ewes from um, from the uh, mine pad release. We're both using the, the guzzler right now. And then I identified six positive identified green air tags here. Um, a follow-up to pick the cameras up um, on mine pad. I uh, positively identified... 11 of the 15 green air tags, so 11 of the original 15 released um, were right on mine pad guzzler. Um, out of that 15, um, I observed uh, nine ewes, five lambs, and a yearling ram, and one ewe with no ear tag. And the lamb ratio at that time was 55 for that particular little group of sheep. Um, while watching them, observing them, like with any disease event, you watch them for a, a long period of time because not necessarily do they want to cough or do anything. Um, on the hill, on the sunny, sunny hillside and stuff, there was the one collared ewe, didn't have a lamb. 
Um, she, which I've been seeing lately, when they're not able to shed their coats and stuff, they'll leave a lot of their winter coat. So she had three quarters of her winter coat intact, um, hadn't shed it. All the other sheep are all, all these sheep so far, everything I've seen is in good condition, um, good body conditions. Um, but after observing her for a while, um, I was probably at a distance of 300 yards or so. It appeared she stretched out and was trying to cough. Um, you know, unless you're really close to them, you can't really hear it. Um, there was another uh, ewe with a green ear tag with no collar um, down below her. Um, had the same thing. Had probably about half of its coat um, still intact from the winter. I observed that sheep do kind of the same thing, kind of stretch out a little bit and appear to, to cough. Um, Nothing else observed on either one of the cameras as far as the settings with the audio and, and video as far as showing anything. But they're only, you know, you're only looking at a 15 to 20 second time frame and then it, then it picks up again. So there could be a, uh, a time frame that you miss in there. Um, this, this ram that was in here, the collar that's still working, the satellite collar, um, he spent a lot of time here, went down here, spent a lot of time in the mine in Candelaria and stuff. Um, he vacated to the Excelsiors. He's hanging now with the uh, Marietta Ram, as far as I can tell from the collar data. They're both tag teaming, and it looks like they're using um, White Rock Spring and stuff. I haven't picked up any of these other cameras yet. I'll probably do it this week for all the, the different stuff. When I picked up cameras here, I picked them up at the original Marietta release site. And then where this, this is, this about somewhere around right here or wherever it was right in here. It's hard to tell. It might be this canyon here, but it's not very far from the Marietta release site is where those two sheep were found, the one six sheep, um, which they initially found. So somebody must have dispatched it later on or something, but there was a 22 found in it. So it was sick hanging around. Somebody threw a bullet in it, I guess, or whatever. Um, and then we found that, that lamb, too, just above there. Now, <clears throat> interesting, what I was kind of looking at some of this stuff, too, a little bit, where that lamb was, about 100, 150 yards, there was some mine activity going on. And, and some of this stuff is still pending, too. I'm just kind of, I was just looking at anything and everything. Well, they were core drilling for copper in here. And uh, when they core drill, you use two mine sumps, 13 by 13, and they reuse the water kind of over and over to re-inject and drill and drill. But in February, these sheep, um, these sheep were using the same area, basically, where this canyon was, where the sheep were found, and just over from where this mine, you know, where they were drilling for the mine. So they were in this area of February, March, assuming April. When I went into that mine, the mine core areas, um, they were full of water, um, what appeared to look like water, um, with, you know, kind of a slick of, like, gasoline-looking stuff on top of it, but sheep tracks all over. So I was concerned initially just to, to check it out. Um, still waiting for the results on the just a water, general water quality sample, and they're looking at the different high concentrations of anything. Um, but those sheep are definitely using that water source. I mean, I don't have anything to verify it, but the sheep tracks the fecal matter, everything around those mine sumps. Um, sheep, it doesn't matter where water pops up unless it's in the trees. They, they, they have a knack for just finding it and utilizing it. And a lot of times, like in the Excelsiors here, in the winter, you'll have these areas in these little slick rock areas and stuff that'll collect winter, winter precip. And there'll be water that's two and a half, three feet deep. And those sheep will find it. They'll be utilizing it until that water dries off and then they go up. Um, pulling the cameras on Marietta, um, I, I identified 17 of the 20 released sheep that I released on there that are actively using the Marietta Guzzler. Um, and then Three, three yearling rams that had no ear tags, so they were just from the Excelsiors. One year, one ewe with no ear tag. And so those were the additional animals that I'd seen on the cameras. Um, 
there was no lambs present out of that group that came from the 20 that were released from the Bear Mountains onto the Marietta Guzzler that basically imprinted on that Guzzler and utilizing it, there was no lambs observed at all on, on the camera. Um, the only thing I, I did observe on one of the frames um, was a little bit of head shaking on, on one U that was not ear tagged. Um, and, it, and, it, and it appeared, and, and I still have the stuff, I guess, I, you know, we could put them all together on a slideshow eventually, but there was, looked like an internal cough, like just like a little bit of an internal cough that I could tell. Um, but that's the only thing I've seen with the Marietta sheep. I, I, I've observed them. I haven't seen any coughing. They all have great body conditions as far as I can tell, but there's just, there's no, no lambs. Um, Defender Guzzler, which is not, not very far. You're only looking from here to here. Um, and then where those sheep were found sick in here, Defender's like right over here. Um, both, both release complements. We had one release complement from Lone Mountain, 25 individuals. We had one release complement from um, Stonewall, both on Defender. Um, the year before, I identified like 15 of the 20 from one of the releases from, um, from Stonewall that were actively using the guzzler. So most of all this stuff that we've, we've put on there, is we've had pretty high success as far as sheep having to use these guzzlers and wanting to be in the, in the area and wanting to stay in there. Um, the only issues we've, I think we've seen and I think will, would be addressed in the future is that we probably shouldn't be moving any rams around of any sort because the ewes seem like they pretty well imprint on certain areas, except for maybe that one that took off for the Monte Cristos a little bit, but they seem pretty honed in on staying in the area and not moving much. Um, so in the Defender Guzzler, um, never found any of the, the released Marietta sheep, never found any of those on ear tags, just found sheep from Lone Mountain from the ear tag, because I got all, I got so many different colors, the Rainbow Coalition around here, but um, uh, so on the Defender, um, I have a large complement of, of ewes and lambs. Um, it's hard to tell actual numbers and stuff. I've been getting pretty much, when I've gone out, lamb ratios in the 50s or so. Um, I did run some sheep off the Defender the, the same day I was over at Marietta. Um, they ran down the mountain, up the hill. Um, they were in a saddle and I observed Two, two ewes um, that appeared to look, it, it seemed like cough to me. But it, it, I've never, I haven't seen anything in relation to some of the die-offs I've witnessed in the Monte Cristos and other things um, where you get a lot of the nasal, you get the dirty face, you get all that kind of stuff. You see, I see, but sometimes when you read Sometimes I read into stuff where I'm thinking, you know, things are happening, but you really got to analyze it. But then sometimes you overanalyze what's actually happening. If, you know, so I don't know. Sometimes I cough, but I don't know how to put a bullet in my head. But um, so it's it's hard to it's hard to understand sometimes if I'm reading too much into something happening or because I've watched like when I had sheep die off in slate and stuff. You know, they're just just everything and then everything's just hacking up and then their bodies condition starts to deteriorate, their, their hinds start skinnying up and everything, and everything in here, even though that they're, you know, something's, something's going on, something happened with those two sheep, um, if they're going to come through it or not come through it or, or what have you, but um, so the next process is just pulling some more of these cameras again, and um, what will happen too will be a fall survey in September, so I'll have some of these initial lamb ratios and then I'll see what I see on, on, on survey as far as if I you know dumped a lot of lambs if I'm down in the teens if I'm down to nothing or I'm st you know at 45 or 35 which is is good enough to me but um, so you got me <laughs> you got any more questions yeah. or something? All right, so um, to try to put a bow on this, um, I, I just think we've just got too much um, inconsistent and inconclusive information. 
um, we, we want more assurances. We want more confidence that if we, if we add more animals in any part of this metapopulation that they're going to have uh, a high probability of being productive uh, and growing and, and having a sustainable herd. And with some of the information we've gathered, I, I just, we think, I think, that we need to take a year off um, and collect more information, uh, more information on disease, more information on the population response, and then um, reevaluate what may or may not be happening in there. Commissioner Lane. You know, I think the information that you, you and, and Dr. Wolf have presented are it's extremely disconcerting. I guess my question, can you tell me the progress of the disease? In other words, if you, if you do these surveys twice a year, can you say at this point everything looks fine and then the next survey you, you do, you know, they're, they're dead sheep or is it much faster than that? You know, are we... I, what's the progress of the disease? How long does it take to go from, you know, I'm hearing about, you know, unhealthy coats as a, as a good symptom of something that may be occurring. So you, but you really don't know if it's a, a, a six month process or a three month process or a couple of years process. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, it's, it's, it's twofold. Um, first, you have to have the vector. And uh, for example, you know, we've been we've been kind of joking with our California Fish and Wildlife folks. Um, thanks, thanks for the early Christmas gift. But um, we don't know what direction this thing happened. I mean, it's likely the high, the probability, the higher probability is because the White Mountains did uh, experience an all age die off sometime in the mid 2000s, um, that it likely came from that direction. Um, so that. Now you have what is going to be the transmission of, of that into the next series of mountain ranges. Um, it could be, could be years. It could be years before it moves in. And it may be, it was years before it made it into Nevada through a wandering ram, possibly, um, a wild, wild ram. Um, but once it gets into a herd, uh, most of the experiences that we have across the West, including us, is it will spread um, depending on the time of year and depending on the groupings, whether you have nursery groups that are grouped up. Uh, it could be, uh, you know, prior to the lambing period and everything split up. So there's not, you don't have a greater, you have a lesser chance of that transmission occurring because the animals are scattered. Uh, and in desert herds, Unlike some of the other Californian Rocky herds, resources are lean and mean, and they're scattered across uh, their winter range. And so, un until they come into summer waters, you don't see those concentrations. So, but once once the transmission hits, um, everything tells us in the past that uh, animals are going to succumb pretty fast, and they're going to either fight the bug, depending on how many bugs there are. Um, and combinations of things and how virulent or uh, toxic they are to the animals. Uh, they'll either survive barely or they'll die in a few months. And then, then the process is the lambs. So that's really the adults. So you could have a 30% die off on the adults or no, no adults or like in the Hayes Canyon we had 100%. Uh, and, but then they're carriers. They're shedding. Uh, and then our concern is, you know, we have these varied responses, as you're pointing out, across the West and within Nevada. We can't tell you exactly what's going to happen. There's no textbook of saying they're going to 80% loss of lambs. Some, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Um, but what we do see is that reoccurring lamb loss from year to year to year um, until such time something something happens, the the, the animals quit shedding, uh, they they overcome the disease, but they still have it. But uh, or those carriers die out. I think that's what a lot of the other states see is 
um, those old 14, 16 year old ewes that were surviving the initial disease event die and with them the pathogens. So we can't, we can't, we can't tell you exactly uh, what, what's going to happen next. Um, so that's why we want to dig into it a little bit deeper. Uh, I'm, I've got a draft capture plan right now that's being circulated across the state with our regions where we're going to focus on this metapopulation. Um, and we're not going to just look at one herd because it's pretty clear to me and our biologists and the data that we've collected over the years that th this whole thing's connected. And um, if, if what is on one end is probably going to be on the other end of this um, in some matter of time. Commissioner Wallace. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mike, in your discussions with the, your California colleagues, is there any thought about checking, taking some current samples? I mean, 2009 appears to be what they have for their last, because I know that hunt is probably either going on right now or it's in the very, very, very near future. Are they collecting hunter arms? I don't, <clears throat> I mean, I know the, obviously speak with their veterinarian, uh, Dr. Ben Gonzalez, and I don't believe that they're actually um, taking any, you know, passive samples um, from their hunter harvested animals at this time. So I think that their thought is that they are continuing to have some challenges in that population, in, in some of the populations within that White Mountain herd that they know they've had ongoing issues there. So, Dr. Wolf, before you get away, uh, you say they don't have any plans, but can we get their list of hunters and we have plans to do something with that ram that's harvested? Because uh, I'm kind of very fond of the place closest to the White Mountains, Volcanic Hills. Mm -hmm. I'll probably be on them tomorrow. Uh, with your video camera, I hope. No, and I, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I know what you guys are saying, and, I, and I, I'm reading that, and it says a, a link with the White Mountains of California, and I, I spent so much time in Volcanic Hills last year, a ton of time between scouting, hunting, my brother, I, I mean, our, our family was on that thing last year, and my M recruitment was fantastic. There was a hundred sheep there that Tom saw during flight. And at one time, we saw 80 sheep on the mountain, and it wasn't like we were just looking at them. We were living with them, spending time trying to get a particular ram, so we were with them a lot and never saw any indication of that. But you're seeing an indication at the same time. If it came from the whites, but the first indication we found out about it was over at Lone Mountain, it, it just it, it's confusing to me. I know what you guys are saying, and the science says it came from one place. But to know what I'm seeing on the volcanic hills, and I'm sure that's why you guys are as confused as I am, it just doesn't add up. There's something going on, but it's not adding up. So it doesn't add up to me, it doesn't add up to you. That means we don't do anything for a while and cause ourselves more problems. Well, and it, it seems that, uh, I mean, I, from some of the caller data I've seen, I've stopped trying to predict what bighorn sheep do when they decide that they're going to walk around. So, I mean, it seems the likeliest spot would be for them to come over to the volcanic hills, but since, unless they had a radio collared animal, which I'm not, I don't think there's ever been any, they've stepped up and said, we saw our sheep wandering around, they might have just zoomed by the volcanic hills and somehow had it in their sights to go over to the to Silver Peaks and to Lone Mountain. And, you know, we puzzled a little bit about this with the um, Southern Nevada disease event, specifically the connectivity of the spring range, where if you look at the map, it's a long sheep corridor, even though their die-off occurred a little bit to the west, but there is that potential connectivity that runs right up into the spring mountains and then it also looks like our sheep moved it potentially from over to Arizona and then across three different mountain ranges within southern Nevada. And where it started, who was the initial animal or where the, the point source was, is unfortunately long gone, you know. And I think we miss, you know, we miss, obviously miss a few of these little die-offs. 
So, I mean, I can speak with um, my counterpart and uh, ask them if they're planning on doing any passive sampling. I don't know what their tag numbers are in the White Mountains, but we can certainly I three. I was going to say two yeah, to three. Two to three. And, um, you know, certainly the using the leftover head is pretty easy because that's being thrown away anyway. It doesn't really yeah. require any extra effort except on the part of the taxidermist. And, and uh, most sheep hunters would be more than cooperative with anything you're yeah. going to ask them of that type. And Absolutely. I'm hoping we can get there with that. Uh, I'm going to rewind Mike two and a half years back to... Uh, <coughs> That controversial thing that we did and something I struggled with personally and that was getting rid of mandatory indoctrination for sheep hunting and uh, it seemed like it was a it was something we didn't really need at the time because the way things were going but with all these new things we have and looking at the disease events and trying to educate our hunters of what to look for and everything is that something we you know, can we help ourselves out by informing our hunters more? It was something that I struggled with in that decision, and, and now I, I'm kind of wishing I hadn't have voted the way I did. Well, and I'll just tell you honestly, I didn't want it to go voluntary, but we were being pressured, uh, government telling people what to do and how to spend their weekends, and. Um, and treating them like, like children, like they didn't know how to hunt sheep. So uh, we felt like, well, let's, let's be responsible, let them be responsible, and let them do their thing. But uh, I would agree that captive audience provides a great opportunity to disseminate information, get information back, um, make sure we're on the same page. Um, so uh, I, I would... I would certainly carry that torch uh, and uh, try to try to see if we can um, bring it bring it forth for next year. If if I'm willing to give up 20 days of scout of sheep, I'm more than willing enough to give up one Saturday because you give it three times to take one Saturday out of my scouting time to learn more about what I'm doing. Uh, I understood why we did it when we did it. I voted to get rid of it, but now I'm looking at it going, maybe we did the wrong thing because we need to get more information. And the only way to get more information is have an educated hunting public. I won't be here to make that decision the next time. You going to be back here? Yeah. <laughs> okay, anybody else have any questions, comments, concerns? My only other comment is I'm going to have to get with Mr. Building and go put a sign up because I would like that thing not to be called the Townsite Guzzler. I'd like it to be called the Ray Robb Townsite Guzzler. <laughs> it, it was purchased at a NBU dinner and has a name on it other than Townsite now. So, what's that? The sign is made the way you want it to be. Yeah, yeah. Jason, 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 yeah. Okay, anybody else have anything? Okay, this is possible action. Let's take it out to public comment. Does NBU have comment on this? Thank you. Jeff Turnip Seed, President of NBU. Um, I want to thank Perry and Jason and Mike for that. That's a lot of work and it's a lot of information and I feel pretty stupid uh, being a lowly engineer. But, uh, you know, on the one hand, NBU is obviously bullish to state the obvious. We want to spend some money on sheep. Uh, we want to put sheep wherever we can in every nook and cranny. Uh, but I can't stand here and argue with the experts. Um, you know, we we have a lot of discussion about this in our on our board about whether if we had today's information in 1980, if we would have started moving sheep at all, or if it would have been the boogeyman and too spooky and you know. So there's there's a divide in our board and our, in our membership, honestly, about how how spooked we should be. But uh, 
very few of our members are biologists or even vets, and so um, we're obviously going to be good soldiers and go along with what the experts say, the science says. Um, but what I would like to request is if, if this is taken off the table, if there's a way to put our heads together to find another place where NBU can spend sportsmen's sheep dollars. We've got funding set aside that, that's sheep money that I'm not going to spend on fishing derbies and grouse research and all that stuff that we do as well. It's either going to get spent on sheep transplants or not at all. So if, uh, if we can find some alternative to spend, even, even on California bighorns, if there's some suitable habitat, uh, we'd love to spend our money on helping Endow grow sheep somewhere in this state. Um, and also on the on the guzzlers, this is particularly disappointing because we just put a bunch of sweat and sportsman's dollars in guzzlers there. Before this information came to light, and I'm assuming that next year's guzzler program is going to be in suitable habitat so that we don't run into this same dilemma at next year's meeting. And uh, I guess we could stockpile our money and, and transplant a gazillion sheep next year, but um, I'm looking forward to putting next year's guzzlers on a map and, f and assuming that that's going to be suitable for proximity to domestics. Uh, research ahead of time on mycoplasma, that type of thing, but short story is we're dying to spend our money and we'd rather not just sit on it for a year. I sat in your seat in 2002, so I know where you're at. Uh, I think there's places you can spend your money that can help us transplant sheep in the future, and that's through gaining science and gaining information, and sometimes science and information cost a ton of money. That's true. And I, I think right now we're better off looking for science and information instead of wasting money. I think that's a good spend of NBU's money. I think it could be a tough sell to some of your board members and a tough sell to some of your constituents. And people spend money at your dinners when they don't see you building gizzards and transplanting and doing disease research, they're going to ask you what you're doing. Right. But I think right now that's some of the most prudent work we could do is try to get our hands around what we're doing. And we have Dr. Wolf and Mike Cox and Jason here, but uh, they're tasked with a lot of the things of the department. I, I think we can work co cooperatively with you guys and come up with ways that we can bolster their ability to do this type of research that we don't have the funds to do. Um, can I ask a question? I hope this doesn't sound ignorant, but is the is the timing of the uh, upcoming transplant season such that the doors closed after today, or could we pull together some handful of biologists and and these folks to try and find out some other way to spend some money on helicopter pilots and move some sheep? Or is today the day? You know, I don't know how how that works. I honestly think with an evolving subject to this, I don't think the doors ever close. I think that if Mike and Dr. Wolf see a need to move sheep because we're overpopulated someplace and we got some place to put it, I think they bring it back in front of this commission, something's going to happen. Because I think that with all this information, we're recognizing we have problems. And I, I think one of the problems we've had is our, our reluctance to bring these herds down to appropriate levels. Sometimes we... We think we can stop by them, they're going to be there forever, and we all love to go out and see sheep, 300 sheep in a day, but is that the best thing we're doing? I, I think sometimes we're going backwards by looking for more. We need to look for the right number. It's a lot of fun. Any other questions for me? Anybody else have anything? <laughs> Any other public comment? Mel? Mel Building, uh, Washoe County. Um, I know we want to look at the White Mountains, but should we be looking at the Lone Mountain die-off in 1983 also? Um, we had a pretty extensive die-off in the Lone Mountain 212 in the 80s, uh, the year after we trapped them and took those very same sheep to the Excelsior Mountains. I mean... 
I know it's really tough to turn loose of what a person has done for a long time, but I think, I, I don't think we should go with this thing with blinders. This stuff has been out there for a long time. And on the Lone Mountains, I, the last number I heard were back up to 450, maybe 500. But that's just where we were in the 80s. I'd like to have some of that stuff addressed also. I mean, we're talking about something that happened in 2005 in the White Mountains. This goes back a long ways. Another thing, um, how there, there's a difference between our deserts and our Californias. So how this die-off, how this mycoplasma over pneumonia affects them. There are several herds that have this disease, that have it, and they're doing just fine. As a matter of fact, they're exploding in populations in three or four areas. So if, if we know we had a die-off in the Lone Mountains in, in the 80s, what killed them? Back then we thought it was pneumonia, we thought it was pastorilla. We had the same thing happen in the granites, we think. Maybe they just ran off. But I, I think there's more than just what happened in 2005 down there also. I, I think we need to be aware of that also. I think, I think when we have this stuff, we need to put everything on the table. And we need to look at everything, not just what we want to cherry pick and, and look at. Thanks. I agree with you, Mel, uh, that it did happen years ago. And that's one of the frustrations I have is we've seen the sheep numbers on Lone Mountain hit those record levels twice. And right immediately after the peak, we ran into the valley. And we hit a peak again, and we didn't address that peak soon enough to make sure we didn't hit the valley. I, I don't know. Maybe the peak and valley is going to come without doing something. But still, we've done it twice now. And, and that's, I think, why we have a you hunt and other things we're doing. I appreciate that. And I, I want to address that one way. For five or six years, I've been being told that, hey, we're going to have a big crash in 212. We're six or seven years. We haven't seen it yet. 